Thank, thank you everyone for coming to this tonight. Um, for those that don't know, I'm, my name is Seamus Monkey. I'm the current president of the Institute here, chapter here in Tasmania. Um, welcome to the Institute offices. We have uh, quite a few people live streaming tonight, so welcome to you all as well. Um, before we start, I'd just like to pay my respects to the traditional original owners of the land, the Tasmanian Aboriginal people, uh, to pay respect to those that have passed before us and to acknowledge today's Tasmanian Aboriginal people who are the custodians of this land. And I also want to thank Lysart, who have been really kind sponsors for this event tonight. Thank you to Lysart. Um, I don't know if I, I probably don't have to introduce Robert Lee. Everyone in the room, I'm sure, probably knows, but no doubt there are people on the live stream that perhaps don't. So bear with me for those that do. But look, Robert is one of Tasmania's most prominent adventurous and innovative architects and is the founder and director of Circa Morris Nun Ch Ch Chua Architects. In the September 1991 edition of the UK Architecture Review, Rory Spence wrote, when Robert Morris Nunn studied architecture at the University of S Sydney University with Glenn Merkett and Rick Lepastre as tutors, he was interested in high-tech solutions. His final project was a tent, I don't know if this is true or not, but his final project was a tent inflated by attaching it to the spark plug socket of his motorbike. It's true. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> keep, we'll keep going. It was driven into the studio for a presentation, apparently. Um, on moving to Tasmania, he changed course dramatically and began to appreciate the strong colonial heritage, which is so much more apparent here than in New South Wales, creating an almost, which creates an almost schizophrenic landscape with frequent nostalgic, slightly distorted echoes of Britain. He has developed a very eclectic approach to form, often drawing upon local precedent, but interspersed with a wide range of overseas references. These disparate elements are used to reinforce the making of memorable places for specific groups of people. And for Morris Nunn, architecture is above all a social art, but one with much scope for invention, fun and fantasy. And that was, as I said, Rory Spence in 91. Uh, the facts. Robert has practised in Tasmania for over 40 years and as Rory wrote in 91 has taken special interest in the social impact of architecture and some of his most successful work has involved working adaptively with the cultural heritage of our state, often integrating innovative structural ideas, incorporating timber and I suppose um, your long involvement with Jim would be sort of testament and catalyst for that. Um, Robert and his practice has won over 50 state and four national awards. His work has been well published and he's lectured widely. He's he was appointed adjunct professor at the School of Architecture uh, at the University of Tasmania in 2008. And he's been an active member of our chapter uh, since 81 and has volunteered his time for numerous institute events, this being one of them, obviously. And he has uh, was awarded the President's Prize in 2010 for, for, for that. And is also a member of the Order of Australia. Now, the more interesting bits. As a young student, uh, I was personally introduced to Robert's work by Rory again, Rory again, on one of his numerous history walks around the city, and I remember Rory explaining to us and drawing connections between the newly built uh, Launceston Eye Hospital and James Sterling's Stuttgart, in Stuttgart, Stats Gallery in Stuttgart. Um, for me, this was a bit of a light bulb, because I remember being quite intrigued by the idea that a building might provoke connections with history and talk to others elsewhere. But I also remember being taken to see another new building at the time, Inverest Groundhouse, and how I was kind of awestruck by the sort of wizardry and structural skill and its curvy accordion-like structure, which is sort of sadly now threatened with uh, demolition. Now, look, these are my reflections, and through, mainly through the eyes of a dopey student, but what, when, when you really want an honest opinion, I go to my colleagues, so I asked around the industry colleagues and pulled together a few reflections on Robert's work and time. Uh, these, are, these are sort of out of context, but, but a few snippets. His work is unique, heartfelt, profoundly connected to place, history and community. Robert finds stories of place and people and recasts them as architecture. Another one, working in Australia's smallest state and economy, Robert has rung large miracles out of pinched budgets and the smallest of opportunities. His many unmade projects hint at what might have been if he'd lived elsewhere. Perhaps that's another lecture. <laughs> um, another person, 
It says, Robert has a quality of extending a broad field of care to the younger generation of the profession. And certainly from this person's point of view, uh, they've been recipi recipients of Robert's enduring support and mentoring. Uh, the stories of Tasmania have long been a preoccupation of Robert's work. His projects capture and reinterpret our, our Tasmania. Experiencing one of his buildings is like being dragged through the mud of Tasmania's psyche, sometimes educational, often dark, sometimes challenging, a little irreverent, but that's Robert, and always entertaining. Uh, two more. Uh, for someone who has succeeded in creating beautiful buildings and spaces for several decades, Robert maintains an env enviable enthusiasm. Allegedly, he enters the office every day, uh, <laughs> genuinely excited about what happened next, which for most of us is kind of pretty hard. We drag ourselves in there, but <laughs> it's, it's wonderful. Um, and then lastly, but not least, his work is light, uplifting and joyful. It is marked by deep respect for place and people, mixed with the liberating possibilities of design and ideas. His is the development we need rather than destroy what is beautiful. His buildings add to the sum of what is extraordinary. So, look, Robert continues to be a significant figure in nurturing uh, Tasmania's current generation of young practices, and he's a leading advocate in Hobart and Tasmania for design, and the architecture profession is richer for it. So, look, thank you, Robert, and I'd like to introduce you to come up. Thank you. I don't need to say anything. This is wonderful. Um, okay, look, thank you for thank you for the institute actually, because what this is is tonight was I going to be a lament I think, uh, and up until less than a week ago, I would say that this building was actually due for demolition. It actually had its approval for demolition already set out and it was, it was on its way out. Um, I think there's a combined action of the Institute uh, getting to the university. I actually made an approach to the uh, Vice-Chancellor. Uh, there was quite a number of things to say, hey, buildings that actually receive significant recognition from the Institute in terms of awards, and this one's won a, a national award. Uh, uh, these need to be respected, and the discussion I had with the project manager was basically, why not adapt it? Well, the ad adaptation is happening, um, it has been saved, and I think that collective willingness to do that meant that sort of something, uh, which was done as a sort of well, a festive gesture back 20 odd years ago uh, to create a structure around the turntable of the uh, Inverness rail yards and the sort of waviness was trying to play with the structure and there's this absolutely wonderful engineer that collaborates with all these structures, Jim Gandy, and this is Jim's forte of just hanging things there, all of that. So it's still there, it's going to be there for another, another 50 years, uh, I hope. Um, and so I thought, okay, I get a chance to talk about something else. And I get to talk about storytelling, which is far, far more important, um, and what this actually means. And what, for me, the whole thing about storytelling is I thought, well, where better could I actually begin than my sort of very, very privileged relationship with the Flanagan family and with Kevin Perkins because all of us ended up doing this structure uh, in a very, very early photo of one Richard Flanagan. Uh, but more importantly, the actual sort of rifle that's there belongs to none other than the mayor of the West Coast at that time, Darrell Garrity. And Darrell has just shot up the conflict sign with his, with his 22. Uh, it's good West Coast tradition. Uh, uh, he's, he's honoured it with the, with, the, with the sort of, well, you can see the bullet hole. Uh, uh, and, and that whole idea of uh, our working and respecting and learning and all the things that went on with, with the sort of the actual inhabitants of the West telling their stories, telling the ideas that things have happened over time. Um, we won a competition to do this. Uh, uh, 
sort of, it was the idea of actually building a conservatory on the site uh, and actually growing a wilderness and the stories inside the wilderness. So we, we created this idea of a sort of, well, a building that uh, it's been described as an ark with a novel inside. So it's a structure that was intended to almost float off at the next, next tide, uh, full of stories, absolutely wacky stories, but heartfelt. And the stories were written all by Richard. There's 40,000 words inside the place. Uh, and it was this chaos. And it was literally designed to be chaotic uh, as, a, as a sort of experience. And, and Richard, but what Richard did, and it was all of us uh, working together, it was a, what this exercise taught me, and, and it was a sort of, if you like, a multi-dimensional learning exercise for all of us, was how much real collaboration could actually get somewhere in the face of absolutely stringent adversity. Because uh, Richard is not, one to be sort of, you know, take things lightly. So, so for instance, the uh, sign above the, uh, it was a symbol of Sarah Island. And as you can see, the HEC figures very prominently in that sign. It's the old sign that was above the uh, main, um, uh, and the stories inside, the stories were about sort of, you know, the bestiality that went on, uh, the various issues that, the stories about the Aboriginal um, Kutakina, he took the view of the archaeologists and he also took the view of the early, uh, what, what is it from an Aboriginal perspective, finding their own identity and, and things like that. And so there's lots of questions and things posed for the entire building. And it was, it was challenging and it was intentionally challenging. And so it ended up in the st uh, being reviewed by the... Uh, the whole of the uh, government uh, in their caucus for about a month, literally, before they actually finally let it be published. And so it became a sort of an international sort of thing. And, and that sort of journey that we all went on was liberating, it was frustrating, it was scary. I almost got beaten up in, um, in Queenstown. I thought architecture was a safe profession. Um, <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> Not with, when Richard's around, but um, um, it's, it's that sort of notion that you put yourself out there, you tell real people's stories, you, you get the reaction, and Daryl is literally the case in point where he produced his rifle, he shut up the damn conflict sign, and that was his honouring the process. And I was very, very privileged to be part of it. So look, just, just by the way that these things are happening, the storytelling goes both ways. I'm telling Richard's story now. Richard sort of ended up writing this. Uh, I, I apparently, uh, he told me that I'm Capua Death in this, who's a drunken publican who sort of builds conservatories all over the Sarah Island. And it's uh, the Grand Mahjong Hall uh, for, the, for the Commandant, which is going to be his claim to fame on Sarah Island. Uh, but Richard, Richard sort of, the front cover of this, for Nanny, for whom I learnt so much about my own art. Uh, it's, it's that pushing of things carefully and, and, and challenging things. Martin, his brother, was also there and saw all this was going on. He actually thought it was a really worthwhile article to uh, talk to The Age about because Martin was a senior um, journalist writing uh, feature articles for The Age at the time. And so uh, Richard and I get to be in here I'm actually, I'm actually by David here. Um, um, before the party at Daryl's place, I've been uh, in the back bar of the Strawn pub with Richard and the architect, Robert Morris Nunn. Nunny, as he's otherwise known, looks like a 19th century artist, Charles Condor, and he's had a laugh that sounds like a mad xylophonist. Uh, <laughs> He is also one of those artists working against the momentum of our age, which is, uh, which is flinging everyone towards the centre. Nunny is one of those uh, uh, but clinging to the edges, creating art that is both grand and distinctly local. And so it goes on. I find humbling to, 
to get that sort of stuff. But it's, it's, it's a mark of collaboration. And what I want to share with you is this whole idea of collaboration and where it can lead. This is another one. This is a very different. This one, I wasn't working with literary people. But what I have started doing with a lot of my work is we have the opportunity of actually putting in submissions to try and win things. The design is not a very strong po point in this, this state. Uh, and so to increase the quality of design, we actually win um, design, uh, if you like, solutions by creating sort of uh, buildable solutions that are affordable and just have a design content as part of it. So this was us winning a submission to design two peers for the uh, centre of, uh, obviously, Hobart. Uh, there was originally a peer there called the Franklin Pier as well as Brook Street Pier. Uh, so the government wanted a free uh, ferry pier. We figured that the only way we were going to get a free ferry pier was to actually build a hotel. Uh, and so that's the way that that was going to happen. There was a bit of a furore about that. And so eventually only the ferry uh, pier was built. Um, uh, but the interesting thing is not the plan. It's this bit. It floats. And, and so how it got to the point where it actually floats was a whole journey of people being prepared to say, OK, we can do this. There's the naval architect, Fred Barrett, myself, Jim Gandhi again, um, all of us saying, yes, we can do this. Uh, uh, Fred describes this thing as a floating brick. Uh, he's a yacht designer, after all. And, and so, uh, so, so, but what it enables us to do is collaboratively and say, OK, there's a willingness there to do this. This is possible, and let's get it done. And so the, the building of it, the very fact that Fairbrother came on board, it had to be built at a three degree slope. So all the precast panels were easy enough. We're building all the walls and things outside, building the roof, the, the floors on a three degree slope it was pretty impressive stuff. This is where you actually cast slots in there. So there was sausages that were actually pushed through the structure and then inflated. So it almost was a reverse engineering of what the Egyptians did. And, and so to do that from no you know, we hadn't done this before, um, and we knew no one had done it before, but sort of by actually getting in there and sort of saying, OK, we can do this, we did. And, and this is the bungee cords that actually connect the floating structure to the, to the sort of the actual seabed. And it looks like those stretch elastic things. Uh, and that's essentially what it is, because it actually allows things to move up and down and stay in the same place. And all this just came together uh, out, of a, out of a collection of parts. And, you know, they, they actually sort of, it, it delivered. And so that sense of, OK, we can actually do this. In this state, that whole sense of collaboration is something that I find personally very rewarding. I find it sort of stimulating. And it's that freedom to say, OK, in all honesty, let's get the best ideas happening. Let's make it work. Let's, let's just do it. Um, and what's also something nice is the best collection of seaweed and struck mollusks and everything else, the happiest group of little animals are literally attached to Brook Street Pier. Uh, it's, the ecology has changed dramatically since this thing has arrived. It's the cleanest part of the, part of the Derwent. Uh, because of all these uh, structures. And these, this is the bottom of the actual sort of spiral uh, structures that, the, that sort of go into the mud. And it's there. So, so we're, part of my thinking is to actually build on these ideas. But the other ones I want to share, I believe in the heritage of this place. It's, it's the history and the stories and things are wonderful. And so to give you an example of one of the smaller uh, projects that we were involved with uh, for an individual client, um, the journey that we went on. So this is Acton out at, um, near the airport. 
It was bought by um, clients, saw Les Lake and his wife, um, and this was the back of it. Um, it was pleasant enough, but you know, there was a building there that had burned down, and obviously this had got chopped off and all the rest of it because of the, the fire. Um, but it never ever got the buildings that it normally should have had uh, because of the nature of these old colonial houses. Instead, this is what happened to it. So the, before the house was built, it had a beautiful, well, not a bit, really, it had a functional old barn. And this, we're talking 1825. And the winds had actually got under this and actually uh, completely dropped it. So, so this was the structure, the ragtag nature of it um, that had grown up over time. Um, but, but inside, which is kind of special, every one of these timbers, this is either adst, the big ones, or the little ones are in fact pit sawn. So it's the idea of the guy that's on top with the saw and the guy that's actually down in the hole underneath. Every, every bit of timber in this is actually created by that sort of process. And it's, it's amazing. We're talking sort of 1820s, and this is pre-circular saws, pre-industrial pre uh, sawing of any sort. And so what, what was done was it was actually delicately, literally so disassembled by two amazing guys in excavators. And they t literally picked this thing to pieces and put it on the ground because it was heritage listed and heritage actually wanted to see these structures. Uh, they, wanted, they, they, they knew that they had a unique materials there and they wanted to see if we could preserve it. So, so it became part of the whole philosophy of the place to try and take it to pieces to, to preserve it. And what we actually found when we started to take these things to, into the ground, uh, put them on the ground, is just what, how amazing they were. So these are the ads logs, um, and most of them fine there, but there's one that's absolutely humongous, and this is it. It's 18 metres long. It's probably the longest bit of colonial timber ever, come, ever to come out of a structure. It was actually quite... Uh, rotten inside, so it had to get epoxied up and things like that. But it's, it is still there. It actually got reinstated inside the building and we put it all back together again. So what we did to Acton was it got the old... It got the, the, the coach house and the stables that it would have had, except that now it's, it's a bedroom wing and it's the uh, kitchens. Um, and so this is Franklin House, the same sort of deal. Uh, coach house on one side, staples on the other. So here's our version of the same thing. On. And so we, we reinstated it. And so apart from strengthening it up, because part of the problem was the wind had actually got to the uh, structure and it collapsed. So we, and as you can see, the, the bottom of the uh, the, the columns were somewhat rotten, so we got steel, uh, steel plates at the bottom. But it actually went back together again. Um, and so, so this is it. And, you know, the builder's initial comments were, Christ, what are you going to do with that load of firewood? Uh, <laughs> uh, but, the, but the whole essence of putting the original structure that predates the house back as the outbuildings... Um, created a sort of quality, this is under construction, and so this is the sort of form that's there. So it's a, it's a contemporary reinterpretation with the, with the 1825 structure up above, and um, it's there. And this actually has hydronic heating actually wrapped up in the roof. Uh, so it's taken something that's very, very old and given it a journey. And I think for my sort of the stories that this timber can tell are far, far, far better than anything could ever happen out of a bit of laminated timber or whatever. So, so that journey that these timbers went on, I, I find a very, very rewarding one. And so I got this a couple of years ago, and it's, I believe I'm the um, architects in some states do get it for their design work. 
but I believe I'm the first in Tasmania to do so. And that was a hugely humbling exercise. But I think it's the fact that sort of it's these stories and things that I collaborate with. And so it's not me that just won this. It was, in fact, the whole group of us that sort of I happened to be the person to represent them. And, but I'm, I am fascinated by some of these structures now. Um, and that sort of idea of building around one um, and floating it in rather than building tall towns in the middle of Hobart, that, that would take the same number of 250 rooms as a normal hotel. Um, but the one I want to share with you is the one that sort of, I want to sort of describe a journey that's starting to happen. It's slightly on its way. It's, it's beginning to sort of move along. And this is one that I want to make certain I pushed to a reality while I still can. And so this is a rather unique part of Tasmania. This is, this is Research Bay. This is the um, very, very southern tip. And it's, and it's where these two boats sailed around in 1792 under Bruni d'Entrecasteau and actually sailed in here and anchored there. And that's the first time that they actually sort of really were able to stop because of the west coast and things like that. And it was after staying from there for about a month, they eventually sort of got to meet the Aboriginal population and they were camped on this beach just here. And so the, the first meeting between Europeans and the Aboriginal um, community uh, Abel Tasman didn't meet the Aboriginals. He saw the smoke and things, but he never actually met them. The French did. The French actually pulled out a violin and started playing. And the Aboriginals didn't like that at all. They just flew straight off the nearest other end of the beach. Uh, but they did, sit before that, sing the Marseillaise. And the, the Aboriginals liked the Marseillaise, so that's fine. Uh, but that, that whole nature of how these two cultures actually came together is absolutely fascinating. At this point here, they had, um, they built the a scientific explorer uh, for measuring uh, magnetism and things and trying to relate that to longitude. So there's a whole lot of exploration going on at the time. And so this is, this is their uh, tracking of the map in, inside Research Bay. And this is in fact, it's, it's something I have the pleasure of owning which is an original map that, that the cartographers made after they got back. So here's Tasman's map, and here is the French actual mapping of that area. And so, yes, the, the Rive du Nord is obviously the Derwent, uh, pre-Hobart pre and all the rest of it, but that, but that whole sense of a very different world could have been here uh, from their visit. And this is what happened to the place, it was actually going to get logged. So in 2006, the uh, Tasmanian Land Conservancy uh, fought very, very hard and raised money. I think Dick Smith tossed in about a million dollars to actually buy that land and, pr and protect it from the, uh, the sort of, well, the, the actual sort of clear felling that might have happened. And as you can see, it's got various things on it, including the original garden. And this is, this is the French drawing of the Aboriginal community that they met. And they're not sure of the, of the sort of the, the, uh, the canoes that they actually made. So this is, uh, uh, you know, again, contemporary drawing um, published in Paris in 1824. So what we want to do is celebrate this. There's a story there that's unique. And I believe it's an important part of Tasmania's story to actually have these things known. And so rather than just sort of, you know, build a building somewhere, the French stayed on their boats. They came ashore, but they went back and stayed on their boats. So guests should stay on the boats too. And so we've mapped the uh, water. We know exactly where the, where the currents, uh, where the tide changes. So we can actually position them. And this is, uh, I thought I'd sh 
show you my drawings. So this is the idea of a linked chain of canoes. And the canoes on one side, but on the other side, they're the European sort of, the, the hulls of the European vessels. And so I'm interested in trying to create an architecture which is the merging of these two cultures. So this and that. And so the quality is, this is the habitable part of the building and the screen that runs around the back is the screen that's created by, if you like, a, a sort of an idea of the, what the canoes uh, could have been like in terms of the three-dimensional form. And so that idea of actually having the, the two, the, the central heart of, the, of each, each of these buildings being a sort of, if you like, uh, a European sort of, you know, boat hull, um, and you use the laminated timbers and things to actually create those structures, and you, you create a form that sort of has a, okay, dining room on one side, living room on the other side. Underneath in the pontoon, you actually put uh, the kitchens and cinemas and everything else you can put underneath. And this is, the, this is one of the, um, there's a series of small, um, well, the structures where you actually stay. Uh, we're looking at various different options there. Um, whoops, wrong, back, back, back. So, so this is the main one. And you can see that's the corridor, um, and there's a corridor there. And everything obviously faces north, and photovoltaics on the roof, uh, so that, that it can be autonomous. And so that's a we're exploring the different natures of the rooms and things that's possible to be. But we're talking about, we're talking about a fairly small hotel. Uh, this is sapphire-type logic. It'd be not exclusive in the sense that sapphire is built on exclusivity. We're responsible for sapphire too. Um, but that idea that sort of, it's, it's a sense of inquiry that's going to bring people here. And it's a sense of what would happen if, rather than sort of anything else. And you could actually explore the world that the, that the French saw um, two, two centuries ago. And so there, we're looking at sort of different, different suite arrangements. And this is the sort of thing that happens. You start modeling the actual uh, base of what the actual structures look like. And for us, one of the key things is to actually get these structures in through this fairly narrow neck into Research Bay. So that's the size of uh, one of the units, um, uh, the pontoons. And as you can see, uh, we can actually just get it in. And so the actual design of it was actually mainly derived through this sort of issue, which, which normally if you're building on land, you don't have to worry about. But sort of when you're building on water, it's really, really critical. And the other one is fascinating. The French actually planted the world's, or the Australia's first garden down there. And so this is the drawing that exists. Um, and Bob Brown thinks he's actually found the garden. Um, the French archaeologists are not too certain about that. So there's a bit of controversy about that. But it's approximately about eight metres by six metres. And, and so that's where the plants came from. Potager du Bois in Versailles. Uh, and that's literally where De La Haye picked up the, the seeds, brought them across to the other side of the world, and the people there are prepared to help us again finding old seeds to actually plant for our garden. And so the idea is when people stay at this place, they, they live with food that would have been grown um, sort of if well, we need market gardens and things, but we intend to actually create all the heirloom vegetables and things, as well as the actual plants that were pl planted in, in, um, in De La Haye's garden. And so what's actually happened is at Government House, they've actually made the, the garden and they actually can harvest the old veggies. Um, and there's been a couple of really interesting fusion meals between 18th century French vegetables and Aboriginal cuisine. So if you can put the two together, you can actually get a quite amazing sort of culinary sort of uh, delight. And it belongs to this place. 
and it belongs to the two cultures that came together. And it's a sort of symbol of just what you can actually do to sort of show two, two centuries on what people could. This is the idea of actually putting the gardens again close to the water. Um, there's some discussion about that because Park's a bit worried about the seeds from here getting into the rest of the World Heritage Area. So anyway, slight, slight issue there. But, but we can actually, we've work, worked out that we can actually make this thing completely autonomous. It will not pollute any of the water that's there. We can actually get it completely to do all the things that we need to do. Um, and people, uh, because of the small numbers and things, um, it can be. And if, if, there's a, if there's a model that's anywhere near where my mindset is, it's the fact that sort of, you know, someone I have a huge respect for, obviously, Renzo Piano, um, did this thing in um, Namir. But uh, these ones are on the ground. They're, they're stable. The, the ones we're talking about are horizontal. They're, they're an Aboriginal structure rather than the sort of, you know, one of their cultural centre sort of um, structures. But I think if there's an analogy between anything, between what we're trying to do down there and, and anywhere else in the world, it's that. Um, but that, that's Research Bay. And that little blob there is the marine ecologists actually mapping the terrain with, a bas with, a, with, a, with sonar devices to actually get the, the nature of the, of the sort of quality of the substructure of the, of the seabed. And that, that quality is exactly the same as the French saw two centuries ago. And I think that tradition and that story, if that can be part of our cultural inheritance moving forward, then I think as, as architects, as, as people that live in this state, if we can actually produce buildings that tell those sorts of stories, then I think we're doing th good things for the for the uh, communities that are coming after us. Um, and that's my role as an architect to try and make these sorts of things real. And that's the Tasmania I want to live in. And that's the stories I thought I'd share with you. And I'd love some questions. I'm going to stand here and I'll replay the questions so that everyone can hear online. OK, so done. Has anyone got any questions? I guess I have one. I remember uh, I first had this story maybe four years ago or five years ago on, on the bicycle tour around Tassie and yep. you showed us your work around Hobart and you, you showed us the first renders of these, these boat-like structures and I think you said mm, that you'd be asking the, the French government perhaps for support and you know you sort of maybe just sort of suggested who might be interested in supporting it and developing it what is that like? What's okay. the response? It, the French are interested, um, but in a remote way. Um, the, the two things have happened. Um, a number of projects that sort of, if you like, distracted us um, over on the Eastern Shore. Uh, and that's been a mind-bogglingly negative exercise and I just had to put this to one side um, while all that sorted itself out. And so in a week's time, I go for a uh, sort of planning appeals hearing for Rosnick Hill. Uh, uh, that's five years. Um, so, so this has been paused. Um, I didn't want to be doing all of that while this, you know, this is too special. Um, so. Uh, we have had interest from some French people, but where we have to take it now is to get it to a DA. Because it is adjacent to the World Heritage Area, it's not in, actually in the World Heritage Area, so what we have to do is to get the DA and then go back to Parks and do the Parks Registration, uh, the RAA uh, Act that they act under, um, requires an operator. So we. We get the DA, find the operator, and there's several several possibilities, uh, but that hasn't been sort of really progressed until we could come to them and say, here's what the actual deal is. 
And so the deal, I think, is I hope by the middle of next year there is something fairly definite. But I, I want to share the journey with everyone because, yes, uh, we did discuss it. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's that sort of sense of, you know, it's a hidden story that deserves to be told. Um, and, yeah, it's the French, the French are... Well, this year's been appalling by any manner of means. So, so we just wiped off this year. But, uh, but this one, I, I feel confident uh, because it's fairly small scale, can get to happen. Um, and yes, the, the, the people down in the southern part of Tasmania really, really want this to happen. So it's actually got a... And we've talked to the Aboriginal community. They're actually supportive. Um, Bob Brown's been involved. Um, what we've actually done is we've canvassed a lot of the people prior to, prior to bring it forward. So that consensus idea is there, and that's part of what we've been doing as, 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 the, as the sort of the... We're not trying to actually put things out and then, and then sort of say, look, this has got to happen or else. We are only going to actually submit it formally when everyone's happy with it. You still need a DA. So how do you like? How do you put a title to it or something like that? Like, uh, you... uh, the the seabed is crown land, right. so so you get a lease from the government of right. the seabed. Right. It's a, it's it's just like an oyster lease, actually, if you really and, want to know. But then, how does the planning scheme apply to it then? Like, how do you have a front setback? It's a building, you see. Um, oh, the building surveyors love it. Um, uh, building surveyors sort of... Uh, well, luckily, there's a really one... This is part of this, this, is part of this collaborative thing. Um, sort of... They, they go along the journey with us. Um, because, well, Brook Street Pier is a classic example. Uh, the disabled access to Brook Street Pier, uh, the, the gradient of the, of the ramp, works correctly for 80% of the time. Um, and so it's high, neat tides and obviously very, very sort of, you know, when the, when the tides ride out, it drops um, so the ramps are steeper than um, the 1 in 14. But so they're prepared to say, OK, 80% of the time um, is fine. Uh, significant breakthrough there. Uh, uh, getting getting fire safety and everything else um, is is an issue. Uh, the ones that are not physically connected to the land are probably closer to boats, but they're floating buildings. Yeah. And so uh, the fire safety there is you get to a a point far enough away so that the fire engineers are happy that that can be an assembly point. But after that, the assembly point is you've got to bring a boat to it, or otherwise you swim um, to actually actually go away. But, but because this one has a relatively small number of people, then that's that's fine. But but yes, they get to know about it as soon as everyone else, because if they don't sign off on it, then then there's no point in doing it. So so yes, uh, it's it's they they are almost. Along with, the, along with the engineers, they're the people that sort of, yeah, have to be... Day one, yep, the building surveyors. But, um, but that's, that's the other nice thing about here, is the fact that you can actually go and, go and sort of talk to them. Pitt and Sherry are sort of, you know, know that we're coming, so uh, they're, they're there. So uh, it's, yeah, I give a plug for... Yeah, they're, they're worth it. Uh, so, so that sort of sense of... The collaboration, like the the idea of actually taking that old building, the old barn to bits and reusing the timber that sort of was pretty, you know, badly chewed about, broken, all the rest of it, to try and get that. Well, in that case, it was Peter Spratt sort of certifying that that timber was still as good as it needed to be to be the structure of the roof, but. Again, there's a point of departure there that, that is different to what you'd normally sort of yeah. come to come to think about. So, yeah. it's 
It's that suspension of disbelief, which is the interesting part of the exercise. Yes. These projects, perhaps even before you finalise design? Absolutely. Absolutely. So that they're going on with the journey? They, they don't, they just get to sort of, will this work sort of idea. Um, they don't have to generally do much physical work to substantiate things. But, the, you know, they're, they're skilled people. They, they know what will work and what will, won't work. And, and, they know it after ask serious questions very, very much up front and saying, you know, how are you going to do this? Um, and they're loaded. Uh, 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 and you have to provide them with enough answers. But, but I think, again, I've been very, very fortunate because of the sort of the one can carry on to the next one. And there's a degree of trust, if you like, uh, because of the process. And they've, they've seen the respect be maintained all the way through. And so that sense of, you know, they're, they're on it for what they do and they're, they're, they're an integral part of the exercise and, and that is always there and always should be there. So, yeah, but you're right, they need to be there very much in front. Yeah. Robert, hi. I'm from Sydney. I'm, I'm a recent uh, arrival. Um, <laughs> look, look at your, your project. Down there, remind me of the fact that in Sydney, um, developers proposed for a brief period of time for a casino in our harbour, and that was, of course, dealt with swiftly. Um, it's sort of striking that somehow in you, you're a sort of safe pair of hands that people sort of entrust with development, but maybe considered under other circumstances to be slightly sort of you know full on to to choose words carefully. Um, clear that you're sort of, you have a unique position in that you can sort of almost take hold of potential development and, and almost diffuse it in a lovely, considered way. And I just sort of was hoping for your kind of broader comment about, um, you know, I suppose development and private interests and this beautiful little um, place that's Hobart and, and what the future might be like in your view. Do you want to try and... I'm just working out how to, <laughs> how to put that question. Uh, you could replace it. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, it's very, very hard. Sydney particularly, we've actually tried to do some of these floating structures up there in Sydney Harbour, and we've hit a mammoth wall of bureaucracy. And it's a bureaucracy that where they just... They come to... Eventually, they come down here and see that, like, we actually had Lend Lease come down to Brook Street and they expected it to rock and roll. Uh, and they didn't believe that it was stable. And, and so they actually brought a set of marbles with them. And we're talking Sydney developers here uh, uh, to put on the table and they watched the boats, um, the ferries coming backwards and forwards because. The, the Sydney um, uh, ferry, ferry structures are fairly lightweight, flimsy things that do dive around all over the place, and so they expected these to, these to do. So we told them that, that Brook Street Pier was 4,000 tonnes. It doesn't move. It goes up and down. Um, but they didn't believe us, obviously. So, so, so they, they put, the, they put their, the, the marbles out on the table, and the marbles didn't move. Shock horror. Uh, so, the, so the suspension of disbelief, uh, sort of, they, they started to think, yes, this was possible. Um, and, but one of the wags that was actually w uh, with us, uh, there was a couple of bottles and things, and he said, you know, you better go and check those bottles out. They're glued to the table. Um, um, <laughs> and so they rushed over, lifted up. No, the bottles can be lifted up. Um, but just the fact that sort of they, they need to leave some of their perceptions behind. And when you get the bureaucracy entrenched, it's very, very hard to do that. Um, because we were actually looking at trying to put uh, a floating sort of terminal in uh, instead of the over 
to complement the overseas passenger terminal um, in Sydney Cove around the around the corner, um, and you know it could be actually serviced from ferries, uh, and the ferries there you know are, are good ferries, and you could actually get them. So so rather than sort of you know boats pulling up to to sort of uh, East Circular Quay, you could actually get them to the big ones to come into a to a floating structure and then sort of use the ferries to do, do it. No, 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 no. Um, so, so yes, there's a there's a few things like that that haven't happened for that reason because, the, yeah, the the bureaucracy needs to come along with you um, because it 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 does change the rules. Well, uh, I'm going to try and work out how to take things easy. <laughs> uh, and I'm serious about that. Uh, and that, that, because, yeah, th these things come with a certain amount of emotional, um, uh, well, you, you, you wear it on your sleeve, uh, and that, that comes at a cost. And, and I'm going to have to seriously, and I'm saying this out loud, uh, to, uh, to do, try and do that in a more relaxed way. And I think it's about picking and choosing rather than having to do things. Can I uh, ask a twist on that then? Because my yeah. question was, is there one idea that got away? <laughs> Maybe oh, there's a fair too many ideas. Well, pick one. Okay. Like, what's the one that you think? Oh, God. Uh, oh. Um, and there is a follow-up to this. Okay, okay, part B. Um, um, uh, in answer to, well, it's part one that did get away, um, is we were proposing to bring Brook Street type ferries into Circular Quay. No. Uh, so it didn't happen. The entrenched... Um, sort of, uh, well, values were such that the, that, that was the land lease conversation. Um, and no, the, the bureaucracy there just was refusing to say that, that no, it, it wasn't, wasn't, well, it wasn't possible. And it's, there's no reason, you know, we actually worked out that you could actually build them. Um, in fact, you could probably build them in Newcastle at the big shipyards up there, bring them down the coast and have them built with no, no piles, nothing. Um, they could actually float in through the heads. They could actually work. Nah. Um, so that's one that did get away. Okay, so spit that on the tip. Uh, is there a bullet that you've dodged? So what I mean by that is, uh, <laughs> is there an idea that you thought was really good at the time, but in the cold hard light of day, you're glad you didn't pitch it? I am really, really fortunate in so far as people like Jim Gandy actually say, I, I got to deal with these architects that come up with these bloody harebrained ideas and I've got to make them work. So, so Jim's still around. Jim's still prepared to go off and do interesting structures. Um, uh, while he's around, I feel comfortable that sort of we we can dodge things. Um, but yes, if he if he isn't around, then um, I, getting the engineering to to get these things to work becomes that much harder. So, yeah, it's the collaborative thing that works, um, and it's not just me. But yeah. It's Flanagan almost sort of the, the visitor centre in Strawn pushed the pushed the barrow almost to the absolute outer edge, um, and, but that was a political barrow um, that was saying, okay, these people's stories deserve to be told, and I'm going to tell it, um, and we all backed him, and the biggest thing was actually being judged by the. the Robin Gray, as the Premier of the time, actually appointed someone to um, his, 
his secretary, would you believe, uh, who, was, who had an English degree, uh, to look at Richard's words and say whether it was fair and reasonable. And she thought that they were actually sort of effectively propaganda. But because, but, but because there's two sides to the propaganda, then she couldn't actually say that this was not kosher because he presented both sides of the argument. And, and so she let it through. And to say nice things about Robin Gray, when the, when the building opened, he actually spent six hours reading the whole thing from start to finish because he, as for what he stood for, was actually um, presented by Richard as honourably and fairly. And so that was Richard's compact with them that he would treat their values correctly. But by God, the journey was scary. Christ almighty. Um, so, so yes, when Richard writes things like this, uh, it's, it's, sort of, it's, it's, a, it's a journey that is, is beyond any imagining that I might ever have had. So, yeah. Okay. yeah I was just going to ask, um, whose work is Um, I really enjoyed back then the work of Renzo Piano. Yeah. Um, you know, beautifully, beautifully eloquent things. Some of his stuff, and yeah, you know, there's absolutely fine bits of engineering in there too. Yeah. So, so, so he's up there. Um, and Richard decided to call me uh, a sort of, well, uh, a magical realist. Uh, because one of the things I was interested in doing uh, more 20 odd years ago than now was uh, trying to play in a positive way with people's minds, heaven forbid. <laughs> uh, so there's a couple of nursing homes and we, we actually, there's one in the Derwent Valley, and we actually got and made uh, small structures that are reminiscent of the houses and things that the people used to live in between the wars. And we're talking demented people here. Mm. Um, and so these people were actually comfortable in their imaginary worlds because they were their traditions rather than sort of something that was artificially imposed on them. Yeah. Um, it was an imaginary world and their, their imaginary world felt comfortable in that. And so there was a, there's, a number, there's another one up in Deloraine and there's a, there's a childcare centre which is called Bungawitta, which is everything is half full size. And the little kids realise that this is their own scale space and they loved it. And they actually had a sense of democracy that adults would bang their heads on things. Uh, the kids could just sort of run around and, and it belonged to them. Those were really fascinating experiments. Uh, and they attracted an international sort of audience. We ended up, we ended up taking Corumbeen, the one in New Norfolk, uh, to an international aged care uh, conference in Barcelona, and the Americans loved it. Uh, so we had to go to Los Angeles. Uh, so, so that, that sort of, that, that is, okay, a subsection of things. Um, but yeah, that's, that's. I don't know too many people that are playing those games, uh, and uh, but it's it's it is interesting to where people's, you know, how you make people's comfortable in 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 very very unusual circumstances. Yeah. And look, thank you for coming out. It's 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 very special, you know, COVID times and all the rest of it. Um, it's really nice to be talking like this rather than having a building being demolished. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, very nice outcome, so thank you. I didn't realise that, so thank you for telling us. That's good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm about to tell you, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're only chapter president. <laughs> um, look, thank you, Robert. That was fabulous, um, as always, and um, we really appreciate um, you showing us that. Um, and for everyone that came along, and everyone that live streamed, um, thank you very much for coming. Jen and, and Fiona, thank you for putting on. And I'd just also like to thank our sponsors, Floss Up, for the, for the event. Um, there's plenty of cheese and biscuits, so if you want to hang around and have some, knock yourself out. Cool. 
and thank you.